Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video we're going to look at nonlinear least squares problems. We're going to generalize the methods of linear least squares that we looked at previously to the cases where our residual function is no longer linear in its parameters. So far, we've looked at finding the best fit solutions using linear least squares methods. And a more difficult situation is if we want to do least squares for nonlinear problems. And specifically, when we talk about linearity, we're referring to linearity in the parameters and not in the model. And if we think about polynomial fitting, then if we look at a polynomial, p of x using parameters b, then that is nonlinear in x, but it's actually linear in the parameters b, which results in a large simplification that allows us to develop the linear least squares methods. So here, in nonlinear least squares, we're going to fit functions that are nonlinear in the parameters. So let's look at a specific example. Suppose that we have a radio transmitter that's in the unit square, where the coordinates x and y go from 0 to 1. Let the radio transmitter's true position be given by b hat, that has components b hat 1 and b hat 2, where the subscripts here denote the x and y coordinates. Now let's suppose that we have 10 receivers that are located at positions x1, x2 up to x10, where we're using superscripts to denote the different receivers. And so the situation is what we have in this diagram here. The cross here represents the transmitter, and the circles here represent the receivers. And we'll say that receiver i gets a measurement of the distance from itself to the transmitter, that we'll call yi. But this measurement will have some amount of noise. So our goal here is to try and determine the position of the transmitter based on these noisy measurements alone. So let B, without a hat, be a candidate location for the transmitter. And so the distance from B to a particular receiver, Xi, is given by Di of B, which is equal to B1 minus X1i, all squared, plus B2 minus X2i, all squared. And we want to choose B to match the data as well as possible. And hence, we want to minimize a residual vector, r as a function of b, where the ith component, ri of b, is given by yi minus di of b. So here, this is indeed an example of nonlinear least squares. We see here that if we look at our residual, and suppose we looked at two different parameter sets, alpha and beta, and we see here that the residual of alpha plus beta is not equal to the residual alpha plus the residual of beta. So we've broken that usual linearity assumption that we make use of. However, we can still make use of a number of the methods that we had when we looked at linear least squares. And specifically, we can still introduce the function phi of b, which is the square of the Euclidean norm of the residual vector r of b. And we also incorporate here a factor of a half, which turns out to be useful for calculational convenience later on. As in the linear case, we want to minimize phi by finding the b such that grad phi equals zero. And if we look in general, then phi of b will be given by half times the sum of j equal one to m of rj squared. And if we look now at the ith component of the gradient, then we'll have to evaluate the partial derivative d phi by dbi and that can be written then as d by dbi times a half of the sum from j equal 1 to m of rj squared. And the half factor will go away, and we'll be left with the sum from j equal 1 to m of rj times d, rj by dbi. And we'll note here that this is actually equivalent to writing that the gradient of phi is equal to jr of b transpose r, r of b. And here, j of b is the Jacobian matrix of the residual. And specifically then, if we look at 
jr of b and the ijth component, then that will be given by dri by dbj. And one thing that we can do here is that we can actually see that if we're dealing with a linear least squares problem, then this expression actually reduces to the normal equations. And we'll take a quick look at that now. So we've shown that for nonlinear least squares problems, we need to find the minimum of a nonlinear function phi of b, and we therefore need to find places where the gradient of phi equals zero. And we showed that we could express that as the Jacobian of the residual transpose multiplied by the residual. So we'll now take a look at what this equation would be in the special case when we're dealing with a linear problem and we're looking at an overconstrained linear system where we would usually solve using linear least squares methods. So for this overconstrained linear system, we're looking therefore at a, b equal y, where this matrix A is a rectangular matrix. And so in this case, our residual will just be equal to y minus a, b. So to get it into this form of the nonlinear problem, we need to calculate the Jacobian of R. And if we look at the component ij of this, so we look at jr of ij, then that will be given by d by db j applied to the ith component of y minus a b. And here, this y has no b dependence, so it will vanish. And for the other term, we will now write this a b out in terms of components of the matrix form to get then that this is equal to minus d by db j times the sum over k of a i k b k. And now when this partial derivative applies to the terms in this sum, it will only pick out the corresponding bj. And so we could therefore write this as minus sum over k of a i k delta j k, where this is the Kronecker delta and equal to one if j equal k and zero otherwise. And so that will just then evaluate to minus a i j. So in this case, we see then that the Jacobian of the residual is just equal to minus a. So that therefore tells us that if we go back to our nonlinear least squares problem, then for the linear case, we're actually just solving here for zero is equal to a transpose r. And we can eliminate the minus sign because that has no effect due to this zero. And so therefore we'll get that this is equal to a transpose times y minus a b. And we therefore get that a transpose a b is equal to a transpose y. And so we've therefore recovered the normal equations. And so we see then that this nonlinear least squares formalism actually contains within it our previous least squares solution of the normal equations. So therefore, we now want to find a b such that jr of b transpose times r of b is equal to zero. And this has n equations and n unknowns, but in general, this will be a nonlinear system. And we'll have to actually solve it using an iterative method. And this is actually a general theme that we'll see throughout this course. Often if we have linear problems, we can solve them in one shot. Whereas nonlinear problems often require that we do some kind of iteration. And here we'll introduce Newton's method, which can actually be used to solve this system. But we'll actually re revisit Newton's method later on in the course when we get to the optimization section. Let's recap Newton's method. 
that you may have seen for the scalar case before. So suppose that we're given a nonlinear scalar function, f, and we're trying to find a root x such that f of x is equal to 0. Now suppose that we have a current guess for our solution, xk, that we think is close to the true root x. So we could write then that xk plus delta x is equal to x, where now delta x is hopefully small. And since it's small, we can do a Taylor expansion, and we could write then that 0 is equal to f of x, and that's equal to f of xk plus delta x. And we could then Taylor expand to get f of xk plus delta x times f prime of xk plus terms of order delta x squared. So now if we rearrange this, we'll find then that f prime of xk times delta x should be equal to minus f of x k, where we're neglecting higher order terms. So that actually motivates now Newton's method. We could find then a new improvement to our guess by first solving to find a adjustment to our xk. So we'll solve then the system f prime of xk delta xk is equal to minus f of xk. And then we'll define our new guess as xk plus 1 is equal to xk plus delta xk. So this argument actually generalizes to functions of several variables. And suppose now that we've got a, a function capital F that is a function of n variables to n variables, and we want to find a vector x such that f of x is equal to 0, then we can apply Newton's method. But now, instead of having that scalar derivative, we actually end up solving this equation that involves the Jacobian of f. So specifically, to find our update to our guess xk, we want to find our delta xk, we would solve the Jacobian f multiplied by delta xk is equal to minus f evaluated xk. So in the case of nonlinear least squares problems, we need to find a stationary point of phi, and that corresponds to finding a b such that jr of b transpose times r of b is equal to 0. And so in this case then, our f of b is equal to jr of b transpose r of b, and we're trying to find a root f of b equals 0. So to apply Newton's method to f, we need to calculate the Jacobian of f, jf. And here, f is a function of n variables to n variables. So let's now look at a component of the Jacobian jf. We'll look at the ijth component, and that will be given by dfi by dbj. And that is equal to d by dbj of the ith component of jr of b transpose r of b. And if we write that out in component form, that's d by dbj of the sum from k equal 1 to m of drk by dbi times rk. And now we can apply the product rule. And so for the first term, we'll just apply the, the partial derivative to the isolated rk, and that will give us a sum from k equal 1 to m of drk by dbi, drk by dbj. And for the second term, we'll apply the partial derivative to the existing partial derivative, and that will give us the sum from k equal 1 to m of d squared rk by dbi dbj multiplied by rk. So we see here that we've got second derivatives emerging. And in general, second derivatives are difficult to deal with, and they can involve a lot of calculation. So a key observation we can make here is that as this method progresses, we could actually hope that our residual values will get small. And that therefore justifies that we could neglect the isolated rk that appear in this expression. And hence, we could omit that term that's the sum from k equal 1 to m of rk times d squared rk by dbi dbj. So we can actually see that the remaining components, the sum from k equal 1 to m of drk by dbi drk by dbj, can actually be written in matrix form as jr of b transpose times jr of b. And putting all the pieces together, we're then left with the iteration with the following form. So if we're going from a current guess bk to a new guess bk plus 1, and we're trying to find that delta bk, then we have to solve 
jr of bk transpose, jr of bk, multiplied by delta bk, is equal to minus j of bk transpose times r of bk. And this is referred to as the Gauss-Newton algorithm for nonlinear least squares. And we can actually see here that this is very similar to the normal equations at each iteration, except now that the matrix jr of b comes from linearizing the residual. So Gauss-Newton is equivalent to solving the linear least squares problem, jr of b delta bk is equal to minus r of bk at each iteration. And this is a common thing that we'll see throughout this course, where we end up replacing nonlinear problems with a sequence of linear ones. So to apply Gauss-Newton in practice then, we need to be able to compute the Jacobian matrix jr of bk for any bk in Rn. And we can often do this by hand, and that's certainly possible in our transmitter problem. And if we look at the components of jr of b for the transmitter problem, we just have to evaluate this partial derivative applied to this square root. Now, if our residual becomes more complicated, this can actually become impractical. And furthermore, we might even be in a position where our mapping b to y is actually a black box, and it's not something where we have any way to actually do analytical derivatives. And in this case, we can actually use an alternative method to this approach of differentiation by hand. And we can use a finite difference approximation. So here, we could take a small h, much less than 1, and we could approximate each term in our Jacobian in terms of a finite difference using a step size of h. And this can definitely avoid error-prone differentiation of the residual by hand. And it also works even if we have a black box mapping for, for our residual. So we derive the Gauss-Newton method in a natural way. We apply Newton's method to solve grad phi equals zero, and we then neglect the second derivative terms that arise. However, Gauss-Newton isn't used that much in practice because it doesn't always converge reliably. And a more robust variation of Gauss-Newton is the Levenberg-Marquardt algorithm. And here we use the following update. So we use j transpose of bk, j of bk, plus a regularizing term set to mu k times the diagonal of s transpose s. And that's applied to our step delta b, and the right-hand side is then minus j of bk transpose times r of b. And so here then, s would be some small regularizing term. So s could be the identity, or perhaps derived from the Jacobian. And we also have some heuristic method for choosing our mu k. So this is rather reminiscent of the regularized, underdetermined, linear least squares problem that we looked at earlier. So the key point here is that regularization term improves the reliability of the algorithm. And Levenberg-Marquardt is actually implemented often as a standard routine in software packages such as Python and MATLAB. And we need to pass the residual to the routine. And we can often also pass the Jacobian if it's available, or we can ask the routine to calculate the Jacobian using finite differences. So now let's return to our receiver and transmitter problem. So we're now going to look at a Python example for this case called non-lin LSQ that we provide an initial guess for our transmitter location and that will then converge to some solution. We'll now take a look at the non-lin LSQ.py example that can solve the non-linear least squares problem that we described. And here we have a transmitter that's located at position b hat in the unit square shown by this black cross here. And in the unit square there are also 10 receiving beacons that are shown by these blue circles. And each one of these receiving beacons is going to make a measurement of its distance to the transmitter. But those measurements will have a small amount of noise incorporated. And our goal is to use these noisy measurements and make the best prediction we can 
for the transmitter's true location. So if we now take a look at the code, then we first define the transmitter's true location at 0.7.37, and we then define 10 random locations for the receiving beacons. After that, we'll now generate the measurement data that incorporates the, the noise. And for each one of the beacons, we'll evaluate its distance to the true transmitter location, and we'll then calculate an additional noise factor that will add on to those true measurements. We'll also define an initial guess for our transmitter location at 0.4,9. We'll then define the function phi that we want to minimize, and this will take in a candidate location for the transmitter. And for each one of the receiving beacons, it will evaluate the distance from that candidate location to the beacon position, and it will compare those distances to the measurements that we have. And it will return the sum of squares of the differences between the predicted measurements and the actual measurements. We'll also define the gradient of phi, and that will just be given in terms of partial derivatives of the phi function with respect to the components of the predicted location. With those functions defined, we'll then call the levenberg marquardt algorithm library function in scipy, and we'll pass in here the gradient of phi and our initial guess for the transmitter location. Here, we won't provide an optional Jacobian for our gradient of phi. We'll also specify then that we're using the levenberg marquardt method using this additional method equal LM argument. After that, we'll, we'll output our predicted location. We'll also output the gradient of phi at that location. And we'll also evaluate phi itself that will tell us how accurately our location matches the data. We'll then go ahead and plot the results and we'll plot first contours of the phi function and this will show us an entire landscape in the unit square of where this phi function is small and large and it will give us an indication of which regions are most likely positions of the transmitter. And on top of those contours, we'll also plot the beacon positions as red circles, the true location of the transmitter as a black cross, and then our candidate location as a yellow circle. So I'll now go ahead and run this program. And so we see now the contours of this phi function. And we see that there's this basin of small phi values that surround the true location of the transmitter. And the true location is shown by this black cross. And our predicted location, which is the minimum of the phi function, is shown by this yellow circle. And we see here that we're in very good agreement and the two are very close together. So in this example, we use a median amount of noise of 0 0.05. And we'll now run this program again, but we'll lower the noise level. So we change this now to 0 0.01. then we now see that the two are in very close agreement. And it's hard to even distinguish between the true transmitter location and the prediction. Let's now run one further example where we increase the level of noise to 0.2.
and we see now that the distance from our prediction to the true location is increased. And we also see how, in this case, the contours of this phi function are starting to look a little more uneven. If we look now at the predicted locations and the gradients of phi and phi for each of these three cases, we see that in each case the gradient of phi is reduced to a level of machine precision as we would expect. We hope that the lumber marquardt algorithm will actually find a root of the gradient function. We also see that depending on the noise level, the value of phi is different. So when we started with a medium amount of noise, then our phi was around 0 0.004. And when we use a small amount of noise, that was reduced to 0 0.0001. And if we use a large amount of noise, then it was increased to just 0 0.04. And that just gives us a measure of how well those predicted locations would actually match the measurements that we were given. So Leverburn Marquardt measures phi of b, which measures the discrepancy between our receiver data if the transmitter was located at a candidate position b. And if we look at the minimum of this phi of b, then that is the result of our nonlinear least squares program. And so in the diagram below, the black x marks the true transmitter location, and the red x marks the result of our program. And we can see that they're in fairly good agreement. So we'll also note that the contours here are a little bit nonlinear and uneven. And this is actually really a hallmark of this nonlinear least squares problem. And it's actually useful for us to just compare what the contours would look like for linear least squares problems. And here I'm just showing a few examples where we see that we would have these perfect elliptical contours. So it's worth contrasting these two different types of problems, the linear and the nonlinear.